Okay, um, this is actually, that, that, this whole conversation is a perfect segue into mine. I'm actually part of a scholars program here at NYU called the Martin Luther King Scholars, which is dedicated to social justice and um, leadership. And we're actually going to Israel next week to um, observe the Palestinian conflict. And um, I know you were talking about how it's our job to talk to these people and to be revolutionaries. But as a young African-American woman, I'm only a freshman, I'm only 18, I'm just starting my, my, my path as a young revolutionary, how can, um, people like me, people who are also in this room going on the trip next week, um, how can we literally go into this space in Israel and um, try to be a part of the revolution without, I mean, uh, of course there's stigmas of being an American and not understanding how can I, how can my colleagues in the MLK Scholars Program actively um, add to the movement in Israel? Go. Okay. Hi, thank you. My, my name is Laura and my question has to do, I'm from Colombia, and my question has to do with uh, this notion of the personal, this political. I'm glad, I'm really glad that you talked about the way we sometimes take a lot of words, words for granted, and also ideas like the personal is political, but in my experience I have been an activist there in, in Colombia with the uh, workers, uh, organizations, and with the feminist and queer movement. But something that really, really preoccupies me, and I would, the question might sound really trivial, but I, I really would like to listen uh, to your experience um, in the, um, in organizing and what happens with the political as personal because the state and the, this uh, notion of the prison nation is also embodied in you and you have a lot of logics uh, of that that are reproducing your daily experience. So I would like to know how you have dealt with that because if, I don't know, I identify myself myself as um, person with it out that doesn't stand in any box of identity. So uh, to me, sometimes living in the world is a jail in itself. So how do we deal with that? The idea of the personal as political. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Alicia Arrington. Um, I actually was going to comment on the personal as political as well. Um, I'm an organizer and uh, Something that I've run into with my group and what we discuss is the fact that uh, in this country legislation is something that absolutely needs to be changed in certain aspects and um, we're uh, struggling with how to confront that because um, it can be seen that of course uh, capitalism has totally taken over and is running the government and the 1% is absolutely in control of the government and it's not as it was before in the 60s and in the 70s where people could march and people could, could do these certain things and, and uh, bring about the same legislative change that they would uh, before. I, I know that I uh, participated in the Trayvon Martin march and uh, the march on Washington and its anniversary and so, so on and so forth but I feel that uh, Right now, in this day and age, there are far too many distractions and uh, people are not focused on the issues. And uh, I'm just wondering how, uh, as an organizer, to tackle the legislative that needs to be changed in, on a local uh, pers perspective and just overall federally. <coughs> and um, whether or not it's something that should be taken into our own hands as a community to fix the problems in the community that we see and the fact that it is still necessary for the legislation to change as well. Hi, um, thank you for coming. My name is Erica, I'm a grad student here at NYU. And um, this is my first year and one of the biggest questions I have is, I've been, I'm a grad student in humanities but I'm also studying social science and it seems like in a lot of the conversations we have in class, people just seem so far removed from what they're talking about to what's actually happening. Um, I'm the first person to go to college and in my family and I'm also black and working class and a lot of people in my classes don't have that experience so to me it's just troubling because I feel like my question is should academics be held accountable for being more active into the community because I have a huge problem with people coming and 
talking about theories and talking about, you know, this is causing this, but there are no solutions being posed. And this also goes back to your discussion of looking for things that surprise us as opposed to talking about the same things over and over. So as an academic or an aspiring academic, how do we have like, how do we hold academics accountable? Should we hold them accountable for these types of conversations? Hi, Angela. My name's Angelo. Um, <laughs> I, I go to St. John's University. I'm a junior. And um, my question is this. Um, in such an implicit consent society that we have, um, I think it goes far beyond the prison system. I think we implicitly consent to gender roles, gender stereotypes, sexual stereotypes, all this. How would you go about going against the grain and fighting that, and not just fighting it for the sake of fighting it, but fighting it to, I guess, change the system? And I guess, well, since you're so good at going against the grain, I was wondering what your input would be. <laughs> Hi, I'm very happy to see you. And I think we should take a look at this audience and it's a tribute to you that this audience has so many men in the audience. I have been to so many activist important sessions on feminism and they're all women. We don't need to talk to each other. The problem is not the women, the control is the men. So therefore, uh, let me say number one, I am an alumnus I had the pleasure of going to NYU and studying with all the frisky, subversive faculty, and I learned a couple of tricks. So they're not all just sitting and talking about theory. Some of them actually were activists during the 60s. That's when I was here, during the late 60s. Anyway, I'm looking at your title, which says Feminism, Abolition, and Radical Reconstruction of the 21st Century. If you wouldn't mind, I might want to make, just for a moment, an edit, saying feminism, abolition, abolition, and global reconstruction, because reconstruction didn't work properly the first time around. It's not gonna work properly the second way around unless we know that we are in a global reconstruction. Everybody's gotta be at the table at the same time. Capitalism, let's get to capitalism. You spoke about politics, the personal, the political, but it's money that makes the world go round. And until we get rid of poverty, until we get rid of everything and we have socialism, we're not gonna be able to do anything about this. Not everybody has violence in the home. There is human trafficking and sex slavery. That's where the abolition has to start. The corruption is top down everywhere. Thank you. Hi, Angela, my name is Saya Blogafar. I am, when I graduated college, I wanted to be a permanent activist forever and get paid um, and not be poor. So I became a teacher, but I'm still poor. So um, my question is, I work in a, um, a New York City public school where 43% of my students have been recently incarcerated. Um, and every single day they walk through metal detectors and get patted down. And um, I'm taught, well, one of my students said this the other day and said, miss, I'm never gonna pass this exam because I'm not a standardized human being. So I can never pass a standardized exam. And so, I thought it was so deep and every single day I go through this moral dilemma of am I really helping my students or am I really, you know, making sure that they become a part of the system and so, you know, the advice I'm always given and I'm so sick of it is play within the rules, just play within the rules for now. And so my question is should I quit my job? <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Kashmir, thank you for your time. I have a very similar question actually. I'm a social worker working in an alternative to detention program. And I'm wondering, for youth, I'm wondering what you think about alternatives to incarceration in light of your commentary on moving reform to abolition. abolition. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kenyatta McLean. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for being here and speaking to us. Um, going with Sally's kind of um, question around, once you graduate college, there's a big hit for us in terms of, like if you're an activist on campus, it's very hard once you get off and you're like working, you get put, very quickly put into a cycle. And I call it the hamster wheel. All my friends know I'm like, I feel like I'm on the hamster wheel. And so my question is pretty much how in, in our present um, day as 
activists that want to continue to um, make the change the world and make the world better. How do we deal with this? The big rolling, my big thing is my student debt, right? And so that's what keeps me at my job and keeps me not doing the activist work that I want to do. So I guess how do you balance that your personal needs um, and your want to help the community globally? Oh, those are all really great questions, amazing questions. Um, oh. Um, the first question um, from the, the woman who's, on, who's going to uh, Israel. Where are you? Okay. Um, you know, I... Um, I never go places assuming that I have the answer. Uh, and so I would not come to New York from California assuming that I know exactly what needs to be done in this city. What is important is to listen. And you will find people there who are involved in the struggle who are involved in ongoing struggles against the occupation. And take your leadership from them. And I think if you don't close your mind and your consciousness, you will figure out how you can best contribute. Not everybody has to do the same thing. Uh, and this is true across the board. Uh, but I think you will know when you are doing something that you feel will make a difference. You'll be able to figure that out. Uh, but don't give up. And don't assume that you can go there and ignore. Uh, it's really easy in Israel. Because Israel is a very beautiful place. Uh, and you'll go to the beaches. Uh, and, 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 and you'll see the... Um, you know, the, the amazing scenery and the malls and you know, all of that. Uh, so figure out how you can um, visit Palestine and try to get the experience of going through a checkpoint. Uh, and, and you'll see uh, what people have to go through every day. Uh, the, 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 the use of those technologies that we think are um, for people in prison or people who are criminalized, including students, Right, who go to the schools uh, uh, where they use some of those same carceral technologies. Uh, um, but don't stop trying to learn. And I think that you'll uh, do a great job. So thank you so much for your question. It's perfect. Uh, the next one, um, the Colombia, the personal is political, the polis political is personal, and then um, this other question was on uh, the connection between the personal and the political. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Oftentimes we say the personal is political, but we, f we forget the way in which the political insinuates itself into our emotional lives. Uh, and oftentimes we feel that, uh, that we are the author of our own feelings. We are the author of our own thoughts. And we don't acknowledge the extent to which the state has in insinuated itself into our emotional life. And we're doing the work of the state when we think we are simply expressing the way we feel. Uh, uh, those of us who do abolitionist work point out that, uh, and this is a connection um, between the personal and political, uh, and this is an example that, that I always like to give uh, uh, because I experience it myself. Uh, you know, if someone does something um, that's bad to me, something that upsets me, and my first impulse is to figure out how to get back, right? Because that's what we, that's what we learn how to do. And I realized that when, even though I catch myself and talk to myself, and, 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 and I, 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 
I realize that I am embodying the retributive process of, 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 um, of carceral punishment. That that is what happens when people commit an act of harm, they, they're on trial, and then they're forced to like uh, pay their debt to society. Uh, it's like a, a kind of revenge-based justice. Uh, and I realize that I do the same thing oftentimes in my relations with other people. Uh, so yeah, the, you're absolutely right to bring that up. The political does uh, uh, oftentimes insinuate itself and oftentimes guides our emotional life without our realizing it. This is why we have to uh, learn how to ask questions all the time, all the time. We have to question our own responses and not only question the categories we were talking about, but question our emotions. Uh, uh, we have to kind of uh, develop um, um, a way of being that, uh, that is always critical, that is always critical, that does not um, fail to ask questions about any aspect of our, uh, the way we are in, in the world. Yes, the political is personal. Now, there was, there, there, there's another personal as political question, and that one I just wrote personal as political. So, um, what was the specific, but tell me again. Oh, the distractions. Okay, I wrote, I wrote the, I was going to answer the how to avoid distractions. So I put it on another line, so I thought, it's not, I didn't realize it was the same question. No. Uh, we can't avoid distractions. There's no way we can avoid distractions. There's no way we can be focused all the time. You know, a person who's focused all the time on a narrow notion of what it means to struggle for justice would be very boring. I mean, I've met people like that, haven't you? They don't know how to laugh. They don't like to party. You know? And I don't want to be in a struggle with somebody like that because... You know, if that's what they're fighting for, if that's the way they want to be once they, you know, win their struggle for justice, I don't think I want any of that. Uh, yeah. So I think it's really important um, to recognize that not everybody is going to be doing the same thing all the time. And so, yeah, um, people, I mean, I, I like to say that that, that, that everybody should follow their own passion, but just make sure that passion has something to do with changing the world. But you have to do it your own way. You cannot uh, do it in a prescribed way because after a while you will become very bored and you will stop doing it. So figure out how you can make your contributions through something that you really love. You know, something that you're going to be able to stick with. Something that you won't next year say, oh, okay, been there, done that. Uh, and I think that is so important to be flexible and to understand when people um, are distracted. Uh, we all like, you know, we all have to be distracted sometimes. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one of the points that I often make is that we have to also combine a, um, a practice of self-care. You know, they have, we have to be able to rest sometimes, and we have to be able to, you know, to meditate. We have to be able to take care of our bodies and, you know, do whatever we do, whether it's yoga or, you know, whether it's like eating right. And, and we have, it, it's, it's about living the, uh, the politics that you are struggling for as well. Um, uh, yes, uh, academics should be held more accountable. Uh, but it's also true that, uh, that there are a lot of academics who do amazing work. You know, you can't, again, use this category academics to say that, you know, uh, uh, academics are all uh, 
uh, have all bought into the idea that they are the ones who are superior. And one of the things I find is so important is to emphasize all the time, and I try to say this every time I, I'm on an institution of higher learning such as this, uh, uh, that this is not the only place where knowledge is generated. This is not the only place. Uh, and, you know, just because you have a degree, uh, that doesn't mean that you're smarter than your, the members of your family uh, and people in your community whom you may have learned a lot more from, you just don't realize it. You think you learn that from your instructor, but actually you learn that, you know, from somebody. It's just that you may have learned how to articulate it differently. Um, and, and we have to struggle on these, uh, on the campuses as well. Uh, we have to struggle for the right to education. Uh, and NYU is, um, my mother went to NYU as a graduate student, uh, uh, yeah, many, many, many years ago. Uh, and she used the, the knowledge that she got here to do really important work in terms of teaching people how to read. Uh, she was a reading specialist. Uh, and uh, my mother could teach anybody how to read. This is before all of the diagnoses, right? This was before. Uh, uh, ADA, uh, you know, all of that, uh, and yeah, she could teach anybody how to read, anybody. Um, and, um, and she got that, she was trained here in this place. Uh, so, you know, think about how you can use the knowledge that you can acquire in a place like this uh, in order to make a difference in, in the world. And I don't think any, any knowledge is meaningful unless it is going to lead to some kind of transformation in the social world. Okay. Um, how to go against the grain, ask questions. Ask questions, always ask questions. And you said that, uh, that I seem to have been good at it. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't actually intend to. Uh, well, let me, I, I guess maybe I did. Um, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily know what the consequences would be. And you have to do the work that you do regardless of the consequences in, 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 in many cases. Uh, and what, were, what seemed to be really uh, terrible consequences for me, I ended up, I lost my job, uh, my first job, uh, Ronald Reagan fired me. <laughs> I went to jail. I was charged with murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. I was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Uh, and by the way, the, the, the film that describes that uh, whole process is going to be shown uh, on Thursday. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I didn't know all of that was going to happen. I had no idea. If someone had told me, I probably would have said, okay, let somebody else do that. Uh, <laughs> because I always saw myself as the, you know, the organizer, the person who did the, uh, the behind the scenes work. Uh, and that's still how I like to see myself. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I was called upon to play a different kind of role. And, uh, and I don't think I would have been able to do it had not it been for my communities. And so that's the question. That's how I would answer that question. Uh, you can't do it by yourself. It makes no sense to do it by yourself. It makes no sense to think that as an individual, you're ever going to really accomplish anything that, that is of worth and value. But if you are a part of a community that is struggling for change, uh, then that community will protect you. And regardless of what happens, uh, you, will, you will find solace, you will find support, uh, in that community. Uh, so even when I faced the death penalty three times, uh, I realized that I was not alone. And so I did not, uh, I was scared. Yeah, I was scared to death. Uh, uh, but 
I realized that I wasn't scared by myself. And eventually people all over the country and all over the world, literally all over the world, came together. And, and so, you know, when I faced my accusers in that courtroom, I was not standing by myself. I was standing with millions and millions of people and that there was no way in the world that they could convict me. So, uh, okay, Whew. three more questions. Um, yeah, I'm glad that a lot of uh, uh, men are here as well, uh, but uh, I don't think that just because men are men and women are women means that one group is gonna necessarily be more progressive than the other. It's really, it's really about your politics. Uh, uh, and yeah, you're right, I could have said global reconstruction. That, uh, that's an edit that I will accept. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the problem is I wanted to get radical in there. So I, I, I said radical, global, I don't know. I mean, I assumed that, that uh, I thought that that was um, assumed. That radical reconstruction has to mean global reconstruction. Okay, and the teacher, sh should you quit your job? No, please don't quit your job, please. Where are you? It sounds like you're doing the most amazing work. And we need people like you in those places doing that work. So please don't quit. But what I would say is get fine others. You know, find your support, find your community, create your community, because these young people otherwise are gonna be going straight through the school to prison pipeline. They will end up in the, in, 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 in the um, juvenile justice and eventually they will be spending lifetimes in prison. And you can make a difference there. You can absolutely make a difference. So thank you for your work. Alternatives, yes, alternatives to incarceration are really important. Uh, uh, I, um, I guess the only thing I would say is ask questions about the alternatives. Are they really alternatives? Or are they an effort to further expand the web of surveillance and, and carcerality uh, uh, that uh, we, we get from the the, the prison system and the prison industrial complex. But yes, we need alternatives. But for me, the major alternatives are schools and jobs and housing and health care and all of the things that will make it uh, I I impossible for the prison to remain as the major institution that addresses our unsolved social problems. Uh. And finally, one final question. Um, how yeah, what happened? Those of you who are students, you should recognize that you will never again experience a period like this. Um, if, if you get tired of reading, later on you will say, oh my God, I had all of this time, I could read all of these books. Uh, I mean, this is like the best time of your lives. It is. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Uh, and, and be active as well. Active in such a way that is going to create the kind of continuity so that when you graduate and you get a job, uh, um, you figure out how to do that work in that place. You will always do it differently depending on where you are. You can never be active in the same way, but you can always figure out a way to stand up for justice regardless of where you are. You know, even if you are working um, in the very heart of, uh, 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 of global capitalism, you can still find a way. I was invited, I'll, I'll tell you this story and then I'll end. I was so surprised, uh, not very long ago, I was invited to speak at um, a business school, at uh, Babson Business School in 
And I said, did they make a mistake? I said, maybe they think I'm the other Angela Davis, uh, because there's a, you know, a, a wonderful uh, a legal scholar whose name is Angela J. Davis. And I always, we get, uh, people confuse us all the time. So I was thinking, maybe they think I'm the other Angela Davis. <laughs> and so when I got there, I said, uh, uh, well, you know, I have a brother who used to be a vice president at Xerox. And once he invited me to speak at a Xerox conference. And I said, Reggie, are you sure? <laughs> because I am not going to soften or blunt my anti-capitalist critique. And he said, yeah, I know. That's why I ask you. Uh, so anyway, I got there. And I was so, I was so pleasantly surprised. Uh, it was such a, I had a, really wonderful time there. And it turns out a lot of people, which this, it, it, it kind of gives you a sense of how capitalism has uh, overdetermined everything that we do. A lot of the people there want to become like social, social justice entrepreneurs. So I said, social justice entrepreneurs. Okay, okay. <laughs> But the point is, uh, they were seriously thinking about how they could use that uh, business school knowledge to make a difference in the world. And I end by saying, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you can take a stand for equality and justice and freedom. Thank you very much.